Okay, good afternoon. I see that most everybody is in the um, actual Zoom meeting now. Thank you and welcome for joining us. My name is Kathleen Ahrens. I'm a professor in the Department of English at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and director for the Research Center of Professional Communication in English. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to invite our speaker today to talk to us about source domains in metaphor analysis. Dr. Gudrun Reiners is a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in 2017. She's the Assistant Professor of Language Use and Persuasive Communication at the Center for Language Studies at Radboud University in Nijmegen um, in the Netherlands. She investigates the use and effects of metaphor across different genres and communicative settings with a particular focus on science communication and science journalism. She also has a strong interest in methodological in innovation in metaphor studies and has published metaphor identification methods for various languages and various types of metaphors, including deliberate metaphor. I've known Gudrun for a number of years now. She's a very, um, a very, I, the word for it in Chinese is xi xin. So she's, she's just a very um, analytical and she gets into the weeds with all her data, which I absolutely love. She's just very detailed. Um, she is, we are both serving on the research and applying uh, metaphor uh, executive committee, the RAM Society, and she's also a member of the Metaphor Lab, Lab Amsterdam, and she has participated and helped organize the um, Metaphor Festival. So she's a metaphor expert, and we're very glad to have her here today. So let's welcome her. Thank you very much, Gudrun. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for the uh, introduction. And you should be able to hear me. <laughs> I think there's plenty of other people um, around as well. Um, and so thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to give this talk in the online seminar series. I'm, I'm really happy to, um, to be able to do this and I'm grateful um, that you asked me to, uh, to give this talk today. Uh, to talk about methodological innovation, well, that may, may be a big term, but at least to say a few words about a methodological project that um, I hope to submit to an academic journal later this month. So I'm looking very much forward to uh, discussing this new method with you and to hearing your thoughts, comments, suggestions that we might even be able to incorporate in the, uh, in the final manuscript that we're going to submit. So um, I'm just going to double check. I'm going to run this in this way. All right. Um, you can see my screen if all is well. We double check that. So let's start. And before I start the actual talk and introduce myself in a, a little bit more detail, I would like to begin this talk by showing you the circumstances in which I finalized this talk over the weekend because they may be very different from the um, meteorological circumstances that you are in. I don't know uh, which parts of the world you are exactly, but uh, if I'm not mistaken in Hong Kong, it's about 25 degrees or so today. So it's quite different from, um, from what we're experiencing at the moment in Amsterdam, where I live in the Netherlands. Um, yesterday, we woke up to a white and snowy and very windy uh, world. And um, this picture was taken just outside my neighborhood when we went for a walk and it was really freezing cold and it was this wind and there was snow and it was this sort of snowstorm. But we enjoyed it very much. We don't get these kinds of winters often anymore. <laughs> and so uh, the whole country is sort of happy to see that there's snow now and there might be ice. And the canal that you see here might be frozen by the end of the week so that we can actually go ice skating, which is something that a lot of Dutch people really like. So. Um, I wanted to share with you this image because this morning when I was doing the final preparations, I was thinking, oh, it would have been great to actually have been in Hong Kong and to present this live to you um, because I like Hong Kong a lot. Um, one of my best friends lives there and I, I, the, the RAM conference was there a few years ago. and It's just a, a great atmosphere to actually a uh, great city to be in. But what we have here now, I look outside my window at the moment and I still see the snow and I see a smaller canal that's already frozen. So I'm also happy that we now have the opportunity to do these kinds of talks online so that we can actually um, enjoy uh, the best of both worlds in that sense. So, um, you know a little bit about me. Some of you might already know me. I, don't, I can't really see who's in the audience exactly, but just um, a few words 
to say a little bit about what I do uh, as an assistant professor at uh, the Center for Language Studies in, uh, in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, I work as a, as a teacher, as a lecturer, and also as a researcher. And so as a lecturer, I work in the Department of Communication and Information Studies, and um, I teach courses on intercultural communication, language and persuasion, and also crisis and reputation management. Um, but when I do research, I mostly focus on metaphor and metaphor and science communication, but also on um, uh, methodological innovations, as I said before. And so since this talk is going to be about methodology, mostly, I'd like to briefly mention two methodological publications that might be of interest. You may have seen those publications, but um, if you're relatively new to metaphor research, these might be two interesting things to take a look at. The first is the yellow book that you see on the slide. It's a 2019 book that I co-edited. Um, and it's about metaphor identification in multiple languages. So uh, we invited metaphor research from all over the world to contribute a chapter on metaphor identification in a language of their choice. And uh, this, uh, this book contains chapters on, I think, 14 different languages and also uh, one or two chapters on uh, the practicalities of how to run to how to analyze metaphors in discourse by using the metaphor identification procedure or MIP um, that you uh, that you may have heard about. The second one is a methodological paper uh, that introduces a method to identify potentially deliberate metaphor in discourse. It's a paper that was published in 2018 in the journal Corpus Pragmatics. And that is part of my PhD dissertation. That's the red book you see on the slide. Um, and my dissertation was all about uh, distinguishing between deliberate or potentially deliberate and non-deliberate metaphors. So if you want to know more about that, you can uh, contact me or you can also find both the, um, the paper from Corpus Pragmatics and my whole dissertation uh, online, they, they are both openly uh, accessible. Final thing that I want to mention before I really start talking about uh, uh, identifying source domains is uh, the fact that um, uh, uh, I have been a member of the executive committee of, the, uh, of RAM, the Association for Researching and Applying Metaphor for a few years now. And um, I think that RAM is a really uh, a nice place for people who are interested in metaphor research to, uh, to connect with metaphor researchers across the world. And so um, two and a half years ago, the annual RAM conference was held in Hong Kong. And I think that many of you actually attended that conference. It was really, it's a great conference. And this year it will be held again uh, in hybrid form this time partly on campus in Lithuania and partly online. And it will take a place in June. So if you're interested in metaphor research, you can take a look at the RAM website, uh, which is ram.org.uk to find out more about this conference. It's really a good opportunity to uh, hear about current metaphor research, to engage in discussions about metaphors and to get to know people who do research that might be of interest to you. So that's what I wanted to advertise first. All right, so let's move to the topic of today's talk. Professor Ahrens invited me to talk about a project that I have been, uh, been working on for some time now together with Professor Christian Burgers, whom you might know. And Christian and I share an interest in methodological research. Um, and I think that we first started talking about this project that I will talk about today about three years ago. And some of you may therefore have also already seen some presentations on this topic, for instance, at the RAM conference in Liège in Belgium in 2019 and or virtually in Norway <laughs> last summer. And in this project, we developed a method for coding source domains in metaphor analysis. And so, as I said, we're finishing the paper uh, in which we introduced this method. And I'd like to share that with you and give you sort of a sneak peek of the latest version, the final version of, uh, of this procedure. Um, so 
if there are any questions, you may use the chat, I think. And so Professor Ahrens will then collect them and then we can discuss the questions once I've finished my talk. So don't hesitate to, to write down your questions as, uh, as, I, as, I, uh, as I go on. So I expect that most of you have some knowledge about metaphor and metaphor analysis, but because I wasn't sure what prior knowledge um, to assume exactly, I thought it would be a good idea to start off with some basic metaphor stuff. And if you talk about basic metaphor stuff, then um, we need to talk about linguistic and conceptual metaphors. So there's broad consensus among metaphor researchers that metaphorically used words can be seen as linguistic, linguistic expressions of underlying mappings between conceptual domains. So, um, You've probably all heard about conceptual metaphor theory, and since the introduction of this theory in the 1980s by Lake of and Johnson, a lot of metaphor research has aimed at identifying conceptual metaphors by clustering sometimes invented examples of linguistic metaphors um, uh, that fit under the same conceptual umbrella. So, for instance, metaphorical expressions such as we're at a crossroads. It's been a bumpy road and she has reached her destination in life. All use language that can uh, be associated with travel or journeys to describe the abstract domain of life. So crossroads, bumpy road, reaching a destination, all words that are related to journeys and travel, but they all are used here to describe what life is like. So these linguistic metaphors that we just saw are generally considered expressions of the underlying conceptual metaphor, life is a journey. And conceptual metaphor analysis is an important part of many metaphor studies because um, such metaphors are considered to provide a window onto human thinking and maybe even behavior. So by analyzing the ways in which people talk about one thing, the target domain, for instance, life, in terms of something else, the source domain, for instance, a journey, we may gain insights into the way in which people actually think about life in terms of a journey. So that's why people have focused or have tried to uh, formulate those conceptual metaphors based on the analysis of linguistic metaphors. So, um, this is really a topic that's big in metaphor research. You wonder why then <laughs> it is still necessary to do more research on this topic or, or add more to that discussion. But one big topic that uh, hasn't received as much attention is how we actually get from linguistic to conceptual metaphors from a methodologically sound perspective. So a lot of research on conceptual source domains or source domains is still based on intuitive analyses or on very broad analyses, automated analyses that we think not always do not always take into account a very specific aspect of metaphors that I will be talking about today. But before I do so, um, I wanted to see, but that's going, probably going to be a bit difficult since we have quite a lot of people present here, but just, okay, so let's, let's just do it this way. Think for yourself about this, the question um, I'm going to ask now, um, which is um, what the source domain is for the example that I'm going to show. So in a second, I will show you an example of a quote from a newspaper article about uh, the US presidential elections last November. And the target domain of this example can be identified as politics. But the question is, uh, what is the source domain? And I want you to focus then on the verb defend. So here's the example. Georgia Democrats defend embattled Republican Secretary of State. If you focus on the verb defend, what is the source domain? And to help you a little bit, I uh, looked up this verb in the dictionary and I um, copy pasted the different uh, senses, sense descriptions that are available for, for this verb from the dictionary. 
So think about this for a second. <laughs> Which of these descriptions would be the source domain of the verb defend? Protecting someone or something from attack, saying things to support someone or something that is being criticized, preventing something from failing, stopping or being taken away, to be the lawyer in a court case who tries to prove that someone is not guilty, attempting to win a competition that won last time in order to keep your position as a winner, or playing in a team sport in a position in which you're trying to prevent the other team from getting points. I don't know, what is the source domain? Can we actually appoint the source domain or a single source domain? The question of how we know what the source domain of a metaphor is has fascinated uh, us since the start of this project because for one of us, one description was a likelier source domain than the other sense descriptions, whereas for the other one of us, it was the other way around. So we realized that there may be something going on with the identification of source domains. And other researchers have also thought about these questions. For instance, uh, Richie, who argued in a 2003 paper that many linguistic metaphors that are typically considered expressions of the conceptual metaphor argument is war, such as strategy and attack, could just as well be identified as expressions of the conceptual metaphor argument is a game of chess. Still, Despite the fact that source domain identification recently has become a more popular topic among metaphor researchers, with some very interesting publications having appeared over the last few years, the goal of many uh, source domain identification procedures or methods or papers is still to identify a single source domain or the source domain for any given linguistic metaphor. Richie's observation that linguistic metaphors that are considered expressions of one specific conceptual metaphor could just as well be consistent with one or more other conceptual metaphors uh, suggests that specific linguistic metaphors do not, by definition, belong to just a single source domain, but can instead be considered belonging to more than one related source domain. And especially when co-text or context is absent or when the co-text or context are underspecified, multiple source domain candidates may thus be available for the single linguistic metaphor. So the same word may have a number of different possible source domains. At present, um, to the best of our knowledge at least, no identification procedure, no reliable identification procedure is available that actually provides guidelines to identify multiple possible source domains in a systematic uh, and non-idiosyncratic way. So we argue <laughs> that it may often be unclear which is the source domain that should be selected because neither the co-text information in the text itself or context information outside the text may provide no or insufficient cues for a specific source target domain mapping. And so rather than identifying a single source domain, we propose that the first step in source domain analyses should actually be to allow for the labeling of multiple possible source domains at once. And this then reflects the possible strategic use and interpretation of source target domain mappings for both senders and recipients in a transparent way. So um, that would then be the first step to actually allow the identification of multiple possible source domains. And a second step in source domain analysis would then be to determine which of the identified possible candidate source domains is the likeliest source domain in the specific example that you're analyzing. So um, I hope that sort of the introduction of, so the setting in which this, this whole um, 
identification procedure that I'm going to introduce next is clear. The idea that there may be multiple source domains, the idea that people have actually suggested that this may be the case, but the lack of a method to actually reliably um, identify all those different possible source domain candidates. That was a starting point for our uh, research. And so, uh, as I said, we talked about this for uh, quite a few years now, and we have now developed a method for coding source domains in metaphor analysis. And I've um, uh, copied the, uh, the flow chart that we use in the paper on this slide, and it might be very difficult for you to actually read it. But uh, I'm going to walk you through the whole uh, procedure step by step on the next slide. But first, let me say a few words um, before we go into detail. Because it is important to note that we start from the assumption that in many cases, the source domain of a metaphor may be underspecified in discourse. So the step-by-step -step method that we have developed takes this into account. And the method relies, uh, at least the first steps of our method, rely on the metaphor identification procedure, MIP, that was introduced by Jazz and also MIPVU, which is the extended version of the metaphor identification procedure that was later developed at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And that is the, uh, the yellow book by Steen and colleagues that you, may have, uh, that you may actually have in your possession, or you may have seen. And we use the metaphor identification procedure as a starting point to determine whether words are used metaphorically. And that implies that we use the lexical unit as our unit of analysis and that we use corpus-based dictionaries to determine the different conventionalized meanings that lexical units can have. Okay, so that's an important starting point for the things that I'm going to discuss next. So let me walk you through the procedure step by step and then apply it to the example we saw before about the Democrats defending a Republican Secretary of State so that we can actually come to sort of a conclusion, maybe, possibly, hopefully, which of the sense descriptions from the dictionary is a possible source domain for that metaphor. And let's begin with the top half. Um, that should be easier to read <laughs> than, uh, than on the previous slide. Um, and if you are familiar with the metaphor identification procedure of the Praggle Jazz group, these steps are probably very familiar because we basically use those first steps of the MIP to uh, also start our own analyses. So as an analyst, you need to read the entire text that you want to analyze to get an idea of the contents of the text. You need to know the setting. You need to know what the text is about before you can properly analyze um, uh, the text, all right? So uh, the, the headline that we're analyzing here is part of a newspaper article that describes support from a group of Democrats for a Republican Secretary of State representative in Georgia after the 2020 presidential elections. And you know that there was a lot going on in Georgia um, with the counting of the votes. And so a group of Democrats now supports a Republican uh, state representative who was in charge of the recount of the votes. So that's the context. That's the, the, a short description of the text um, that this example comes from. And then step two is determine the lexical units in the text. And uh, this can be quite a, a difficult task. Um, I won't go into details at this point, uh, and I just want to keep it simple today and say that each um, orthographic word is a lexical unit. So this quote then consists of eight lexical units. The third step is to look at the first relevant lexical unit. And in this case, the relevant lexical unit, the unit that we want to analyze is the verb defend. We then need to establish the meaning of this word, this lexical unit, in the context of this text. We need basically to determine, to formulate the target domain meaning. In this context, the lexical unit defend 
refers to the group of Democrats supporting their Republican colleague in the way, uh, no, and the way in which he handled the election and the recount of the vote. So the lexical unit defend um, can be uh, the, the meaning of this uh, uh, verb can be found in the uh, Macmillan dictionary and uh, it says to say things to support someone or something that is being criticized. Okay, that's the second sense description for this verb. Now, the next step in the metaphor identification procedure is to determine whether there is a more basic meaning available in the dictionary that contrasts with that contextual meaning, but can also be understood in comparison with it. And this is where our method starts to deviate. So let's take a look at the lower half of the flowchart, because our, set, our method really centers around the issue of basic meanings, which can be seen as source domain candidates. And whereas having a basic meaning is all you need to establish that a lexical unit is used metaphorically according to the metaphor identification procedure, we argue that it is necessary and useful to examine all possible basic meanings, all source domain candidates in a bit more detail. So as an analyst, you should examine all other available sense description in the dictionary and determine whether they constitute a more basic meaning of the word. And here are all the sense descriptions again for the verb. And it's good to know that more basic meanings contrast with and can be compared to the contextual meaning of a word and that basic meanings are typically more concrete, more precise, related to bodily action, or historically older than the contextual meaning. So depending on how many sense descriptions are available in the dictionary, and depending on which of those sense descriptions are more concrete, more precise, more related to bodily action than the contextual meaning, Step five of our procedure yields a longer or shorter list of possible source domain candidates. If no more basic meaning can be identified, which could also be the case, then there simply is no metaphor. Okay. But let's assume <laughs> that um, we're talking about the verb defend and the contextual meaning has to do with uh, saying things to support someone, then we can actually identify three uh, other sense descriptions for this verb that are either more concrete or more precise than the contextual meaning. And in this case, um, that's sense descriptions one and five and six. So protecting someone or something from attack is different from saying things to support someone, but the two can also be, be compared because just like protecting someone from being attacked causes support for someone in a difficult situation, saying things in support of someone uh, is, is similar to that. Um, and in this sense, we could say that censorship from one is more concrete than the contextual meaning. It reflects a more basic meaning, therefore, of the verb. The fifth sense description is about attempting to win a competition and trying to keep your uh, position as a winner is different from saying things to support someone. But again, these two sense descriptions can be compared. In both cases, the person or group that does the defending tries to avoid a loss. And in this case, we could also say sense description five is maybe more concrete, more precise, than the contextual meaning of saying things to support someone, and therefore it reflects a basic meaning of the verb defend. And a similar reasoning uh, is uh, going on for sense description six. So we have three possible source domains um, for the verb defend. And the next step in our procedure is to use the dictionary definition. Sorry, I'm going to go back. That is six. <laughs> to use the dictionary definition to label the potential source domains um, of the more basic meaning or meanings. So we're going to go back to 
the sense descriptions that we identified as potential source domains. And for the purpose of analysis and for the purpose of actually also uh, running a reliable analysis, we need to sort of put a label on these uh, sense descriptions. And based on the analysis of the more basic meanings of the verb defend, um, we can say that the democratic support for the uh, Secretary of State is described in terms of attack, competition, and sports. So what we basically do when we label the source domains, um, we, you need to look at the sense description and sort of um, uh, summarize the sense description in a single word. So three possible source domains um, and three labels. And this is where I want to tell you a little bit more about the labeling and how our procedure is in fact um, reliable. This step in the procedure is really crucial because it is about the identification of possible source domains. And so we carried out a series of intercoder reliability tests to examine whether source domain labels can be defined in the same way by multiple coders. And uh, I did this together with my research assistant, Claesa de Vries, and um, we double coded parts of a data set that we used for this study and also for another study. And uh, for this purpose, we selected nouns by looking at metaphorical domain constructions. So that's combinations of an adjective and a noun, for instance, financial bubble or financial hit or political dynamite or political point. And in each of these constructions, the adjective points out the target domain and the noun is used metaphorically. And we looked at these kinds of constructions because they are a good proxy for systematic research because the target domain remains the same. Okay, So if you, if you look at constructions that start with the adjective political, such as political dynamite, political point, then you know for certain that the target domain is always going to be politics. And you can analyze the nouns to find out what other possible meanings are available that could be identified as sources. So we looked at a total of 318 nouns with political as a target domain, uh, and a total of 103 cases with financial as the target domain. And we then calculated reliability for each of the frequently identified source domains. And as you can see here, the results ranged between moderate agreement and almost perfect agreement for the source domains that we identified, that we labeled. Um, and we thought that was very satisfactory because it suggests that two coders can independently label possible source domains with the help of a dictionary and our step-by-step -step coding scheme in a reliable way. But you might be wondering, <laughs> Um, what next? Because we show that we can actually identify source domains, um, multiple source domains. We show that we can label them. We show that that can be done in a reliable way. But for DEFEND, we now have three possible source domain candidates. Is that the end of the story? And we think it's not because the final step in our procedure is meant to establish which of the identified potential source domains is the likeliest source domain candidate. And this is done by examining whether information in the context or context of the metaphor provide cues that suggest which of the basic meanings is the most likely or the likeliest source domain candidate. And to illustrate how this works, uh, I will apply this step to the example about the Republican Secretary of State. And I think that I should also have time to apply it to a second example to show you how it works in different settings. So what we do is we go and look for cues in the co-text or the, the, the text surrounding the example that we're analyzing or the context, the broader situation in which the, um, the text is produced to look for cues. So suggestions that point us towards the likeliest source domain candidate. Um, let's take a look at our example here. So we're still interested in defend and we identify three possible source domains, attack, competition and sport. 
And to determine if one of these more basic meanings is a likelier source domain candidate than the others, we look at cues in the context or context of defend that point to either of the source domain labels established for defend. In this case, uh, there is another metaphorically used word in the immediate context of defend that expresses another aspect of the situation by means of a similar source target domain mapping between a person that experiences a lot of problems and physical violence, namely embattled. And for embattled, there is only one possible source domain candidate available in the dictionary that very clearly refers to violence and attack. So here, embattled can be taken as a cue, allowing the analyst to identify attack as the likeliest source domain candidate. And I hope that this is clear. If not, uh, don't hesitate to post your questions in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll try to explain in a bit more detail later. But that's the idea. So in the immediate context, there's another word that's used metaphorically that expresses the same source target mapping between politics or support uh, as a target. And in this case, violence or attack as a, as a possible source domain. And so, because there's another word in the code text that expresses that same mapping, um, as an analyst, you can say, well, I take that as a cue that uh, defend, the, the likeliest source domain of defend is also attack. So number one, protecting someone or something from attack. Okay. Yes, so I think I still have a few minutes left to provide a second sample analysis to show how context sometimes provide uh, indications for the intended source domain. So in the, the, the example of defend, we looked at context, words in the immediate environment of, uh, of the, the word that we're analyzing. Now we're going to look at the broader context, so the setting more broadly. And the example on this slide is taken from the book Wells Fargo, Advancing the American Frontier. And it was written by Edward Hungerford in 1949. Um, maybe we take a look at the quote first. At an early age, he was able to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange and immediate, immediately immersed himself in the financial network of American railroads. Um, the book is about Wells Fargo, and that's an American company that started during the California gold rush in 1849. And the quote describes the life of Edward Harriman, which is one of the central figures in this company. So at an early age, this Edward Harriman was able to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, and he immersed himself in the financial network, and network is the word that we're going to be analyzing, of American railroads. In this context, network is used to describe a group of people or organizations that collaborate. So that would be the second sense description that I copied from the Macmillan Dictionary on this slide. All right, a group of people, organizations, or places that are connected or that work together. As you remember, the next step would be to see if there are any possible more basic meanings available in the dictionary. And there's a total of four definitions in the dictionary, one of which, the second one, is the contextual meaning. So we need to look at one and three and four to find out whether they are potential more basic meanings because they are more concrete, more precise, related to bodily action and contrast, but can be compared to the contextual meaning. Um, and in this case, the two definitions of network that can be identified as more basic meanings would be sense descriptions three and four. Um, sorry, so the set of computers that are connected to each other so that each computer can send and receive information to and from the other computers, which is a more precise and also maybe more concrete meaning of the noun network. And number four, a system of lines or similar things, such as roads or wires that are connected to each other, which is also very specific, precise, and maybe also very concrete sense description. So we identify number three and number four as potential target domains. 
And these can be labeled or summarized as computer and connected lines or similar things. Now the question is, which of these two source domain candidates is the likeliest source domain in this text? So it might be different in other texts, but we're looking at this specific text about um, Wells Fargo. And this um, Edward Harriman man who uh, was able to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. All right, so the mapping between source and target domain expressed by network in this example can either be between computers and companies or between a system of connected lines and companies. And in this example, no information is available in the immediate co-text of the noun network that provides cues to determine which of the two source domain candidates is the most likely one. And therefore we need to consider, need to consider the, co the context sorry, in more detail. And in this case, we're specifically focusing on the historical context. And one, of the, uh, one aspect of this historical context of this example that is particularly relevant is the fact that it comes from a book that was first published in 1949. So if we want to analyze the example in its historical context, the computer related meaning of network must be ruled out as a source domain candidate because it only occurred for the first time in 1962, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Sense description four, which refers to concrete connections of lines or similar things, is thus um, the only remaining possible source domain candidate and therefore the most likely one. So as I hope to have shown in this presentation, it's really important to take into account the fact that metaphorically used words often have multiple possible source domain meanings when going from linguistic to conceptual metaphor. And I have introduced a new method for identifying source domain candidates and hope to have shown that this method can be reliably applied by multiple independent coders. In the paper, uh, we provide many more details, uh, many more analyses, and we uh, illustrate how to analyze and identify possible and likelier, likeliest sorry, source domains. So um, since I only have 40 minutes to present this whole thing to you. I focused on two different examples, but we have many more and also show how sometimes that last step is, is really quite a struggle um, in the paper. So for now, I think that was all for today. I would like to thank you for your attention. And as I said, I'm open to any questions, comments, suggestions, and I posted some references uh, on this slide, so thanks.